I recently did a video where I talked about the Q500, a optical mouse design that uses fiber optics internally and is different from every other kind of optical mouse ever designed. Uh, I opened it up and speculated about how it worked and I think we all had a pretty good time. However, sometime before I released my video, LGR put one out where he showed off a different mouse, the LMOX2, that looks quite dissimilar and there's a lot of differences. It's got the sensors in different places, uses a completely different mouse pad, and yet there's enough similarities that I was positive these came from the same designer, if not the same factory. The most telling thing being that the third button on both mice performs the same bizarre special features. I had sort of figured that these might actually be pretty much the same mouse, just with different firmware. Uh, I should mention in the previous video that I had proposed that this might actually be using a ball mouse controller chip and that the special mouse pad it uses is actually a rotary encoder that's been unrolled into a linear shape. But a number of people commented and made fairly convincing arguments that that was not possible, uh, which is fine. It was just a, a fun little theory. The much more likely case is that this just has a microcontroller in it. So I thought that maybe LGR's mouse was pretty much like this one, just with different code. However, shortly before I finished my video, I realized that I had missed something. His mouse has a lot more fiber strands on each sensor than mine does. And that suggests some more radical internal changes. So I sent him a message and asked if I could get pictures of the inside of the LMOX2, which he was more than happy to provide, uh, but he just wasn't available before I had to release the video. So I just went ahead and put it out. Shortly after I released the video, uh, Clint went ahead and sent me those pictures, and it turns out that it's completely different inside. In fact, so different that he offered to send it to me so that I could open it up and try and explain how it works. And here it is. I think this goes without saying, but I'm very grateful to Clint for sending this thing to me. Uh, it's kind of amazing to watch a video about something fascinating and confusing that a million other people have seen and then get to take it apart with my own two hands and try and figure out what makes it tick. But hopefully my attempt at an explanation is worthwhile. Uh, we'll get to that though. Let's take a look at the mouse first. Now I'm not gonna go through the whole thing. Um, if you wanna see the basics, you know, the what's in the box, what the mouse looks like, how the included software works, etc. you can go over to LGR's channel. I'll uh, put a link in the description. I'm just gonna go over what's different between this mouse and the other one. I did wanna mention one detail I missed uh, in the last video. I've been speculating about when exactly this mouse was made. I was guessing about 1996, uh, but in fact, in LGR's video on the LMOX, uh, the driver software actually has a copyright date of 1996. And if these really were made by the same people, then there's a good chance that they both came out at about the same time. In other words, I was right. And what's exciting about that is that 96 was a very early year for optical mice. In my previous video, I accidentally said that the IntelliMouse Explorer came out in 96, I think. Uh, I was actually reading the date for the original IntelliMouse, which was a ball mouse. The Explorer, which pretty much brought optical mice to the masses, didn't come out until 99. So this thing actually beat it to market by three years, which is killer. And it's kind of shocking that nobody's ever heard of this thing. So if this one came out that early, then uh, this one probably did as well. And in fact, there's some evidence to that inside, which I'll show you later. So, two of them. They have a couple similarities, uh, visually speaking. Uh, they've got the slab sides and high gloss surface finish, but otherwise they're pretty different. Uh, the feature button on the Q500 is in the middle, while the LMOX has it on the side. And of course the overall shape and color schemes differ completely. The pads are of course also different. Uh, to recap, the Q500 has two regions of one dimensional patterns. So each area only contains the info for one axis of motion. This pad has to be this exact size, no larger, because the regions have to be exactly the same height as the mouse itself. Otherwise, the sensor could fall off the bottom or the top of its respective region. Now, something I forgot to mention in my previous video is that while this pad can't be made any taller, it could be made wider. This, for instance, is a perfectly valid pad for the Q500. The sensors still can't move off the top or bottom of their regions, but left to right, no problem. The LMOX, on the other hand, while it still requires a custom mouse pad, doesn't have these two separate regions. It has a grid pattern where the X and Y info are distributed evenly across the whole thing. This one's a little bigger than the Q500, but you could certainly enlarge this one with no sweat. The LMOX pad is also rigid plastic, while the Q500 has a conventional neoprene base, which is really easy to crease. The LMOX pad is also very off-white, like beiger than you'd expect. Uh, like. Here's some normal white paper. You can see it's very beige. 
Anyway, those are the exterior differences. Let's open them both up now. Uh, the first difference, in fact, is, as I mentioned before, the Q500 uses a plastic tab to open it up and no fasteners, which I've never seen before. Whereas the Elmox just has screws like every other mouse in existence. An irritating thing about the Elmox is that the side button is a separate piece of plastic. It's not hinged off the cover or anything. Uh, and so when you open the thing up, this just falls out. And it's actually just slightly beveled on these corners, but not these ones. So you can easily install it upside down into the side of it when you reassemble it. And then it'll just bind when you try to press it. Great design. Anyway, right off the bat, you can tell <laughs> there's significant differences. Uh, the Elmox has a lot more fiber strands, and of course, all the components are in different places. The design of everything still feels like it came from the same people, though. Besides just kind of looking similar, there are certain hallmarks. Uh, for instance, the photo sensor assembly in the Q500 uses a little clamp that holds the fibers together. Uh, there's like a bolt in the side to keep them clamped in there. And then it uses these plastic tabs to fasten them onto the photodiode assembly. So you can just pinch those, pull that off, and there we are. Likewise, on the Elmox, the strands go into the same kind of clamp block, and there's still a pair of tabs here to allow you to pull it off the photodiode assembly. On the other hand, uh, the way the fibers terminate into the base is completely different. Uh, in this one, they use more little plastic clamp blocks that are pinched together and then pressed into these holders in the chassis that keep them held together. This one, on the other hand, just has all the fibers going into a big blob of silicone, which seems kind of worse, but it makes sense because if you look at the bottom here, the fibers are grouped into two rows of four instead of the one row of two that the Q500 has. And this would be a lot harder to clamp. The fibers would want to sort of slip around each other. So I'm guessing this was just out of pure necessity. So about that, why are there so many more strands here? The Elmox 2 has a total of 16 fiber strands, which is four times what the Q500 has. This was obviously what caught my eye, and at first it just looked like total chaos. My initial response was to assume that these two designs had nothing in common. However, uh, after studying this one for a while, I think they aren't as different as they first appear. I think that the alterations on display here are very little more than what was needed to allow the mouse to distinguish X from Y movement on the same grid. Other than that, I don't think the mechanism is that different. As I described in the previous video, the Q500 observes four spots underneath the mouse. There's two here in the vertical orientation, and then two here in the horizontal orientation. One strand from each pair goes into each of the two photosensors in the middle, and then it strobes the infrared illuminators so it can use just two photodiodes to collect four bits of information. This is just enough info to tell whether the mouse is moving onto over or off of one of these stripes. It's the absolute minimum viable product. So the Elmox 2 may have all these extra fiber strands, but they're split into four bundles. And I'm gonna pull off the Terminator block here. You can see that there's four bundles which feed into four distinct photodiodes instead of two. So they're no longer cross-pollinating between the horizontal and vertical sensor apertures. Uh, instead of doing the uh, strobing IR LED thing, they're just using one distinct photodiode for each sample instead of dividing the two. And that's to say that each of these groups is one bit. Even though there's four strands here, since they're bundled together, they're being combined. And the sample the photodiode receives is the combination of four smaller sample points. In fact, if you trace the bundles back to the apertures, you can see that each group of four strands is collected together at the opening in a two by two unit. So this bundle gets the left half of that aperture, and this bundle gets the right half. And then these two bundles get the top and bottom halves of this aperture, respectively. This means that it's still sampling only four spots. They're just larger spots. Now, why do this? Well, one possible reason is just to collect more light than a single fiber would get, but I don't think that's the case. I think the purpose is made clear if you put the pad next to the sensor. 
The size of one square is also the size of one bundle of fibers, and I think it sort of answers itself at this point. Before I got this mouse, I was trying to guess how it could discern X from Y motion, despite using only one color of grid marker. I had some weird speculations about the uh, relative positions of the sensors I couldn't really elucidate, and now that I see it in person, I, I don't think it's that complicated at all. Suppose we're moving the mouse over the grid in the X direction only. Each square is going to pass over one fiber bundle, and then over the next, and then off of it, darkening each one in turn. And the microcontroller could keep track of that sequence and interpret it as continuous motion. But if you look at how it impacts the sensor on the other axis, while the squares do pass over it, they don't produce the right pattern for it to interpret it as motion. They hit one bundle or the other, over and over, producing basically gibberish. So that's that, right? Like, it looks like distinguishing X from Y motion is really easy, which makes me wonder, why couldn't they do it in the Q500? I think I'm missing something here. My brain's not great with this sort of thing. I feel like maybe they needed to make the lines thinner in order for this to distinguish the X from the Y if they were gonna do it that way, but I'm not really getting why they couldn't do that either. So it kind of feels like they just didn't try. This sort of brings us back home because I had been thinking that the LMOX was a later iteration of the Q500 design, and it's certainly looking that way now. Of course, if it was, then they were released very close together. I don't know how I missed this, but now that we can open up the Q500, I can show you that they actually printed the date right on the board. It says 96 as well. I don't know how I missed that. Also, I can now tell you definitively that these were both made by the same people because the Q500 says designed by IOTech on the board and the LMOX says IOTech on the chip. So there it is. They were made by IOTech, whoever that was. I know a number of people commented saying, you know, check out this FCC filing, blah, blah, blah. I have chased everything down. I cannot find anything about this company. They're a total ghost. They existed in California. That's all I've got. Anyway, now that you've seen all the physical differences between the mice, uh, I'm going to go ahead, put them back together, and we'll compare their performance. So, the mouse works. Now I'm going to do several very unscientific tests. First, I'm gonna try drawing a circle in MS Paint like I did in the last video. I'll try with the Q500, and then with the LMOX2. Then I'll try again in the high DPI mode, first with the Q500, and then with the LMOX2. I don't see a lot of differences. They both seem similarly blah. Now the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to try rotating the mouse pad relative to the mouse. See, when you're just sort of computing casually, your mouse has a tendency to start to drift in angle. And it's usually not quite this bad, but sometimes it is. With modern mice, it doesn't matter what angle it's at. But with these ones, because the grid, or in this case, the two axes here, are at these specific angles, if you rotate the mouse, it's gonna see really weird stuff. So it's important that you keep them straight. And that is a severe limitation compared to modern mice, but how bad is it? Well, the Q500 starts to move diagonally on the screen as you rotate the mouse, not surprisingly, but up to about 45 degrees, it remains fairly usable. It just gets a little less accurate. The LMOX2 doesn't do as well. It gets noticeably inaccurate after just a little rotation, and at 45 degrees, it's completely unusable, just jittering all over the place. So you have to keep your hand straight with this one, which is kind of a pain. My final test was to see if I move the mouse very slowly, if I can make it move one pixel at a time. And the answer is yes for both this and the Q500, uh, which doesn't really count for much. See, because of the acceleration feature that's built into all modern mouse implementations, it's pretty much universal that if you move any mouse slow enough, it can be accurate. The problem is that as soon as you start moving with any speed, both the Q500 and the LMOX get really jumpy and hard to control. And I suspect that's actually a serial mouse limitation. Um, comparing between the Q500 and the LMOX and the touchpad built into the laptop, I find that the touchpad is much smoother than either one of these. And now that I think about it, I'm pretty sure on the occasions that I've used a serial ball mouse, they've been really sketchy as well. So I suspect that the serial mouse interface just doesn't update very quickly. So these tests are probably mostly invalid. There was actually a PS2 version of the LMOX and I would love to get a hold of one so I could see if it performs a little better with a better interface. But since this is like the only one in existence as far as I can tell, I don't think that's likely. That said, this is total BS, I'm utterly biased, but the LMOX feels a little smoother than the Q500, maybe? 
One interesting thing I discovered while testing these, uh, I tried swapping their pads just to see if anything fun would happen, and of course they didn't work at all. I just got total gibberish. The mouse bounces around all over the place. But when I put the mice back on their correct pads, it took a few seconds for them to figure out how to mouse again. They just did weird stuff, and then they slowly calmed down and started behaving normally. That means that my interpretation of how these work is completely wrong. They're not digital at all. They must be doing some sort of like analog sampling or something. As much as I wasn't dunking on the Q500 the first time around, I don't think I gave it its due anyway. This seems like a very sophisticated piece of electronics and I can't even imagine what this one's doing. There's one more difference that had me wondering for a moment which one was the better mouse. The inside of the Q500 top shell has nothing special going on, but the inside of the Elmox top shell has a layer of neoprene, and I'm pretty sure that's for light sealing. I'm guessing that because of all the extra fiber strands that are in here, IOTech discovered that light leaking in through the cracks in the case could make its way into the photosensors through the fibers and cause false positives, make it see bits where there weren't bits. So in order to prevent malfunctions in, say, American offices, which are massively overlit with fluorescent lighting, they put this layer of foam in there just in case. I tried removing the foam to see if I could prove this, but even under my strong studio lighting and a powerful flashlight, I couldn't get it to malfunction. So maybe it was particularly sensitive to infrared, maybe if you had a remote control in the same room it would start causing problems, or maybe IOTech was just being paranoid, who knows. To find out if anything touched it, I opened it up and just shined a flashlight right in the inside, and sure enough that does mess it up. But you really have to hit it hard, so I'm kind of surprised they bother with the light seals. It seems like you'd have to be working inside of an arc furnace to get enough light through the cracks to cause problems. With all that said, uh, let's come back to something from earlier. I said that the Elmox mouse pad could be bigger. There's no real reason that it couldn't be. And the cool thing is that unlike the mouse systems mouse that I showed in the previous video, because it doesn't use any sort of special technology, no colored inks or reflective aluminum pad, you could actually make this on a consumer inkjet or laser jet printer. If you copied and pasted the grid and made sure that you didn't disturb the spacing, you could really make this as big as you wanted, like an eight and a half by 11 sheet. Who needs a mouse pad, baby? We got a mouse desk. All right, that's it. Uh, if you're new here, maybe go watch the previous video so you have some idea what all this was about. If you like that one and you like this one, maybe subscribe. Uh, remember, turn on notifications because I upload kind of irregularly. If you really like my stuff, uh, consider becoming a patron uh, because you could help just as much as all these people did with the making of videos like this one, which is to say, not at all because this was a donation from Clint at LGR, who I want to thank again. Thanks, man. I'm still grateful to my patrons though, so thank you to them and to Clint and to the rest of you for watching.